<coughs> As I was saying before, now we have um, Juan Ramón, Juan Ramón Vallarta Robledo. He's coming from Guadalajara, Mexico. Use in different data sets. Um, according to the to different papers, it has a better performance than other unsupervised uh, methods such as PCA or K-means. Um, there has been another paper that also used TDA to identify subgroups of uh, type 2 diabetes patients using genetic data as well. So the objective of this study is to perform a TDA using electronic or medical records to identify unique cluster of TDA of patients with diabetes mellitus. Uh, this is the data set that I use. I have to link different data sources for clinical research from CPRD, from HES, that is like the host information from hospitals, uh, information from the Department of Statistics and from MINAP, which is a data set with inf uh, information from cardiovascular diseases. Uh, these data sets come from the UK, from all the UK, but I only use information from England. Uh, and I have to filter all the patients that had uh, diabetes mellitus that in the end were around 100,000 100, of patients. But I have to say that I have some uh, technical problems with the server because I was working with clinical data. And when, when you are working with this kind of data, there are a lot of issues with the privacy of the information. So I have to work in a very limit, limited uh, server, and I couldn't extract all the information to other server or to other computer because I have like some kind of limitation. And the algorithm was really uh, demanding for this server that I had, so I have to reduce my, my sample. So in the end, I only uh, use around 7,000 patients to be able to, to perform this kind of analysis. Well, this is just some basic data per processing that I did. I mean, I, I uh, standardize all the numeric features and I also convert into dummies all the categorical variables. And this is the TDA. As I said, the, the idea behind TDA is to study the shape of the data, which come from the topology. Topology is a field of mathematics that uh, comes from persistent homology and Morse theory that basically the idea is to to study how the data is connected in some somehow how it's connected and it has three main properties the first one is the formation invariance which state that as we can see here with the letters a and b even though you you make some modification of the data you can see you even though you try to modify the information, you can still uh, understand that a, a letter A is a letter A and a letter B is a letter B. The other one is the complex representation, which basically is like a dimensional reduction uh, understanding that you, you could have a few representation or a few, a few points in your data and this can be uh, very easy to understand as we can, we can see here. We have a, a sphere, and um, with only six points, we can represent an hexagon, which is kind of similar to a, to a sphere. And the final one is coordinate freeness, which basically means that you can use a different coordinate system, but even though you, you change the, the coordinate system that you are using, the, the data remains the, the same. It's the same. It doesn't matter that you are using another coordinate system the data or the shape of the data has to remain similar. So this is the process of the TDA. I, I use this specific algorithm, TDA Mapper. There are another different kind of algorithms of TDA. I use this one. So we have our database, and then we use, or we convert the data into a distant matrix. Using a distant metric, in my case, I use cosine similarity. And then you apply several functions and you define the parameters. In my case, I used two filter functions. The first one was to get a, a complex representation of the data. So I use singular value decomposition. And I use uh, infinite centrality to evaluate how close or far the data points from, were from the center. 
Uh, just let's imagine that we have our project projection of data. So we have a sphere projection of the of some information, and then we filter the this information by a specific feature. It could be anyone. For example, in my case, I filter by by sex. So once that you have your projection of your data, you divide into different. You apply the filter and you divide into different intervals. In, in my case, or in this example, we can imagine that we are just applying a filter over the x coordinates. So it's, it, you, we only have that, like this projection over the x coordinates, and you apply the, the, the intervals in which, in how many bins you want to divide your data. In this case, you can see that we have five intervals, and also you define the percentage of, of overlap. This means how many connections will gonna be created in these clusters. So in the end, once that you define your parameters, you have to you cluster your, your data points into different groups. And finally, based on the percentage of overlap, you create the networks of clusters. So in the end, TDA is like kind of a combination between uh, clustering and social networks. And the main difference for to for example PCA is like in PCA you say this is one or in came in, you say this is one group and this is another group and they are independent. In this kind of analysis you say, okay, this is one group, but it's somehow connected to this other group. So this is very important because in the real world, they are not independent groups, they are somehow uh, linked together. So these are some examples of the filters that I use. The first one is centrality. As you can see, we have the projection of the data points in the center. And then around the center, we have different clusters. And in, in, the, in the end, in the final picture, we have like different vertices that are somehow representing this, this picture of the, of the data. And in the other one, we are using PCA to represent, to represent this same uh, data projection. And we can see it's the same picture, but now using a PCA, we, can, uh, we, we have a different representation of the same information. So the idea of PCA or of TDA is that you can use different filter to project the data into different into different options depending on what are you looking for. For example, you want to get a, a low representation, you could use dimensional reduction function or you can use another one. It could be any statistical function in the end. And I also use some uh, statistical analysis, in this case multinomial logistic regression, just to identify which feature were the most important to each one of the groups. So these are only clinical results. I think this is not important for this presentation. And this is the most important thing for, this, uh, for the presentation. This is the TDA that I, that I had after the analysis. We can see that big group in the center and uh, two few small groups in, in the different sites. Uh, the first group represent like the traditional patient with type 2 diabetes. And the other one, the, the, the one in red, the second one, is, is mainly, are mainly women, and they are, have a lot of complications, a lot of clinical complications, and the other one is representing mainly men, and they don't have any clinical complications. They, they are like the healthy ones. Um, we can see here another alternative output that I think are really important because here I change the parameters and you can see even though I'm using different parameters or different information, the data remain, the, the shape of the data remains similar. You can see a big group in the center and two few small groups in the different sites. So I think this is really important because it's somehow, somehow validating all this information. Um, what is most important from the clinical aspect is that we have our group number two, uh, uh, the, the green one, and you can see that this group has a lot of clinical problems like depression, hypertension, etc. But at the same time, it's the group that don't use to smoke, uh, is the youngest group, and also is the, the one that performs more physical activities. So it's like kind of a contradiction with, a, with the, this kind of patient. And in the other hand, we have the, the group number three, that is the oldest group. They smoke, 
Um, they don't perform any physical activity, but they don't have any clinical problems, or they have few clinical problems, which is kind of the opposite that we'll be expecting. So the idea with this is that it could be another reason or another explanation of why they, this patient have uh, diabetes. It could be because they could, be, they could have some cancer, HIV, or another kind of disease that, that is causing this uh, diabetes. Not their, not their lifestyles. So another conclusion is that TDA is a useful algorithm to visualize high dimensional data into a lower representation, and it could be very useful to, to find clusters in data. And finally, I want to thank to my sponsor, to the National Council of Science and Technology in Mexico, to the Bank of Mexico, and the Secretary of Public Education, and uh, UCR scholarships for sponsor me during my master and uh, AstraZeneca for sponsor me to perform these projects. Many thanks. Thank you so much, Juan Ramon. Um, next, we have Mario, Mario Banuelos. Uh, he was, uh, com who's coming from uh, the agricultural town of Delano in California. He earned his BA in mathematics from California State University, Fresno, Fresno State, and he obtained his PhD in applied mathematics from the University of California, Merced. He is currently an assistant professor of mathematics at Fresno State, and his research is around mathematical biology and statistical models for genome evolution, among others. His oral presentation today will be about, about tagged optimal search through activation function space. Thank you, Mario. Thanks. All right. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much uh, for having me here. Thank you so much, Laura, for organizing this. Um, as was mentioned, um, I'm a first-year faculty at Fresno State, and today I want to talk to you about uh, TAC, this optimal search uh, through activation funct function space. Uh, this is the first time that this, this work is, is going to be uh, discussed here, and uh, I want to start off similarly uh, to my collabor collaborator, David, uh, his presentation where I want to acknowledge the students uh, that really put in the effort to work on this. So, I was fortunate enough to be the postdoc at MSRIUP. Um, it's the Mathematical Science Research Institute uh, undergraduate program in Berkeley. And um, the, the three students are, are also here uh, in the audience. So that's really great that they get to, to participate in this. And just the organizers for this uh, undergraduate program. So this is work done in six weeks, and then that'll become apparent as to why we use some of these data sets that we did use. Okay, so the problem is deep learning methods um, address approximation of data. They, they should be generalizable, and that's uh, kind of the bread and butter of what the work I do is. Um, and oftentimes these hyperparameters and activation functions help accomplish this task. And so, Along a similar vein, instead of looking at, for example, a fixed learning rate, usually what's done is after a certain number of epochs, the learning rate decreases. Um, but you can also think about this as um, there is recent work done in cyclical learning rates where you actually set a minimum and you set a maximum, and then you cycle through uh, these learning rates. And it's a very different approach than just setting a learning rate and then continuing and then setting another one and continuing, right? So you're kind of trying to learn that as uh, you go along in the problem. And so this is kind of the similar approach that we applied, but instead of picking an activation function and going with that one, we want to let the data inform the problem. So there's many activation functions, right? These nonlinear transformations. There's too many to enumerate. Uh, if you look at my poster, there are some uh, listed on there. Um, and then I, you kind of just forget these acronyms. Like RELU, LRELU, SRELU, right? You, you kind of get inundated with all these um, acronyms for these nonlinear transformations. And so 
the traditional approach for picking an activation function for a particular architecture is one, you fix the model, two, you exhaust exhaustively incorporate different activation functions, and then three, you report the highest accuracy model. And by and large, most people don't do this um, as primarily in their work, though you just pick one. Almost, most of the time it's Tanch or ReLU, right? And then that's what they go with and they wor worry about other parts of the architecture or the application. And so the goal is why not let the problem inform the activation function? So not fixing it at the get-go, but having at each layer potentially a different activation function that maybe later can inform you so something interesting about th that problem. And so what you can think about is, we're not proposing a new one, we're going to minimize this L2 distance. Um, and you can think of, right, a norm in, for continuous functions in an interval A, B as the following expression. And so when you think about distance between two functions, F and G, that distance becomes this difference in the, this norm area. And so this is our approach, is to use a generalized function, particularly Tanch, uh, to minimize this distance between existing activation functions and letting you explore that space. So we propose uh, two parameter. Um, in fact, it's the most generalized version. It's generalized ta Tanch activation functions, which is called GTAC, um, which is just a affine function times Tanch. Um, and it contains some of these classic ones, Tanj, Sigmoid, and more recently, uh, Swish, which is, just, which is just X times Sigmoid. Um, and it approximates functions like ReLU arbitrarily closely, right? And so this is what, uh, what we're going to propose. And to create this parameter space, we form this convex hull of these nonlinear interpolations between three of these activation functions. Remember that you can still approximate any of these arbitrarily closely, but when we parameterize it to interpolate between these three, uh, this is the expression we have uh, for TAC. And what we do is we initialize parameters from this uniform distribution um, to begin our search for these. And so I just wanna, I'm, I'm a very visual person, so I also wanna just, visually show you what this looks like. So you have these two parameters, mu and gamma, and on the bottom right is swish with a parameter one, right, it's just x times sigmoid. You have the sigmoid function, you have a shifted tanch, and then uh, everybody's favorite, or most people that I talk to's favorite, uh, rel you, you, you lives on this um, two comma gamma line. And this red square represents where we're going to uniformly pick our parameters, um, you and gamma. Okay, so what we did, as, um, and mostly what the students did in these six weeks is initial exploration with MNIST with Poisson noise with fixed learning rates and lower resolution uh, images that I'll show you are upsampled to 20 by 28 and then classified with this Lynette 5 architecture, right? So, uh, the students didn't have access to necessarily the most uh, advanced GPUs either. Um, you can ask me about that later and I'll tell you uh, one of the ways they got around that. Um, but this is the data they were looking at. And so on the left is this just uncorrupted MNIST most people um, have forgotten about. And on the, the second, third, and fourth panel is, the second is a 28 by 28 version of MNIST that with Poisson noise on the third panel is 14 by 14, and uh, on the last panel, I think that one's the four by four uh, version. So my training is a lot on using low quality data to make predictions. Um, and one of the reasons why you wanna use a kind of corrupted version of data, um, particularly Poisson noise, is because it has applications in night vision, um, medical imaging, and so if you ask, oh, well, Mario, why don't you just use real data of medical images? Um, you can, and that's certainly uh, an application I've seen here as well. 
But there are other further applications um, that you can think about, and that's really where my training comes in. It's more in bioinformatics and applied math, and the idea then is if you can create a generalized model for this kind of problem, you can apply it to problems in, in genomics, which have this feature of this post-hoc mess, right? So this is the name of the game, is low quality data for this first um, experiment. And so what they did, right, is they classified these images, and no, not surprisingly, the 28 by 28 with Poisson noise, uh, TAC does better. Um, but it does better also for 14 by 14, 7 by 7, and 4 by 4 images. But the problem gets harder, right? And so that's something that I think is worth exploring, maybe not with MNIST, and that's actually something that uh, is the future direction of this work, is providing a Poisson noise version of CIFAR and downsampled um, CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100. But we saw initial improvements in this, in this regime. So after that, it was in, without you know, making the students work even more after the program, uh, we, I took it upon myself to incorporate some more recent architectures uh, using TACT and other activation functions. And we see um, an improvement also in test accuracy here. And this is just a, a kind of these standard plots where if you do fix the learning rate and then uh, decrease it after a certain number of epochs, uh, we get comparable error rates. And if you update these parameters to use triangular learning rates, data augmentation, um, I kind of searched and looked at these particular architectures, so wide residual networks uh, with these blocks uh, and these darknet architectures. And as a, as a ca caveat, we, these plots don't show the state of the art um, CIFAR training or test error rates. Um, and so that's kind of where we're moving towards, but it does show an improvement, all things else being equal. So everything is the same for all these architectures. And in low epoch regimes, we see an improvement with TACT. So uh, we see here leaky ReLU, ReLU, and TACT, and they're, they're all kind of the same. Um, and then on the bottom, or in this purple, is TACT and ReLU, which is combining these activation functions. And then you can say, well, what does this look like? And so in this light blue is ReLU, and for the dark purple and the red, we have the parameter values for tact, right? So you still see this nonlinearity, um, and we can see this even further in other architectures. So here, right, in the first 50 epochs, tact does comparable to leaky ReLU, and then you kind of see that it does a little bit worse uh, towards the end. So this is really kind of shifting our focus to focus on lower epochs and trying to get the state of the art um, within lower epochs, but then changing the activation functions. And so in the other slide, it didn't really look too much like a ReLU. Um, and then this, this particular two examples, you have something that's really close uh, and something that is still just nonlinear. But it really goes to show that there is some promise in not just fixing the activation function for every layer. And so um, some of the conclusions is that by letting this data drive the choice of activation functions, we achieve competitive test error rates when compared to popular activation functions. And we're currently conducting a more thorough comparison um, across more activation function and architectures, as well as working on releasing this public data set for CIFAR 10 uh, and CIFAR 100 with Poisson noise, as well as uh, being downsampled. So um, with that, I'd like to thank the following institutions um, and fund funding agencies. Thank you.
you so much, Mario. And uh, we're very lucky to have here our next presenter, Claudia Perez Arpino, coming from Venezuela. Uh, Claudia is a PhD candidate in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department at MIT uh, in the Interactive Robotics Group since 2012. She received her degrees in Electronic Engineering and Masters in Mechatronics from the Simon Bolivar University in Caracas, Venezuela, um, where she served as an assistant professor in the Electronics and Circuits Department um, from 2020 to 2012 on the robotics area. And she participated in the DARPA Robotics Challenge with Team MIT from 2012 to 2015. And today, she's gonna present um, learning how to plan for multi-step manipulation in collaborative robotics. Thank you so much, Claudia. Thank you. One second. Oh, yeah. This one. This one. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Claudia, I'm from Venezuela. I'm currently a PhD student in computer science at MIT working with Julie Shah in the Interactive Robotics Group. So uh, today I'll be talking about my work on learning how to plan for multi-step manipulation tasks uh, in collaborative robotics. Uh, so collaborative robotics is uh, recently a new wave in which we would like to see robots and humans working together as opposed to where robots have been classically successful, which is working in isolation, for example, in industry uh, and manufacturing. So here I'm showing two, case, uh, two examples, uh, for example, in industry, where uh, honestly everything is done either 100% with automation or 100% manual work but there is no coexistence of these two uh, entities to do work together to accomplish what uh, they are not able to do alone by um, in, in any of these tasks. And a different case is uh, not when they are working together in the same uh, physical workspace, but instead they are collaborating in, uh, in a remote operation setting. So for example, um, if you think about what happened in Fukushima, Ideally, we send robots uh, to this space to do manipulation tasks because it is uh, unsafe and unhealthy for humans to go there. But the reality was that it was really hard to send robots uh, to do any useful work, like just opening a door or like going uh, up the stairs was very difficult to any current robot. So here we're trying to move from something that is completely teleoperation where there is a human basically moving joysticks to move the robot joint by joint uh, to something in which the robot is able to understand the scene and propose some tasks or some motions to the operator so that it is an intelligent collaborator as opposed to just kind of a puppet. Uh, so, uh, oops, sorry. Okay, an example of uh, one on one, uh, sorry, one-to-one -one human robot collaboration with shared workspace is this application in industry. Um, and here you can see that the robot seems to be collaborating with the human, <coughs> but it seems to me from the video that the robot is just doing, <coughs> sorry, is just doing uh, steps that has been pre-programmed by, by an expert. Um, and not only that, to go from one step to another is actually being cued by, at least it seems to me, it's being cued by the human operator by pushing that button that you just saw there. So it has a routine that has been pre-programmed by an expert and it just goes through those steps uh, by, by the cues from the human operator. And if we look at the other case in which there is human robot collaboration in this remote setting, uh, this is a video from uh, the DARP Robotics Challenge uh, where we're, we're practicing this uh, opening and closing the valve. And even though you see only the robot here, 
there, there is really uh, a human operator behind the scene uh, telling the robot what to do and how to do it step by step. And again, here, everything has been pre-programmed in advance uh, by an, an expert programmer. So in my work, I'm trying to move from this paradigm to something in which the robot is a more affluent collaborator. And my research proposition is that that involves uh, to um, equip the robot with some uh, capacities that are more intelligent. And I'm very inspired on human intelligence because this is the best proof of existence that I have access to. Uh, so I, I will claim that some properties or traits of human intelligence that would be useful for collaborative robotics are the ability to learn, uh, learn these manipulation tasks from observing humans doing them, and then being able to execute that task that you learn from the human now executed together with the human. If you think about people, we can do this. You can teach me something, I see it, and then I'm even able to do it together with you, which involves understanding the steps and understa understanding that you could do some of those steps and I could do others. And finally, adapt to different work uh, workflows. So if I teach you one task and you learn exactly the way of doing it, uh, that's one step and that's the first step I'm gonna talk about. But a second step further is, well now we can uh, provide the robot with some system to now discover new ways of doing that task. And if you think about humans, we do that as well. If you teach somebody how to assemble, for example, a part, disassemble, assemble, or disassemble, um, the other person probably discovers or immediately think uh, predictively in a different way of doing that task. So in particular, today I'll be talking about two steps of doing this process. The first one is going to be learning the multi-step manipulation tasks uh, in which the robot will observe a human demonstration, but it will only observe the geometric aspect of it. So let's say you teach me something and you pick up an object and transport it and release it. As I watch you, I only have access to the shape and the position and orientations of the hands and how you execute the task, but I don't really observe uh, the physical parameters of the objects involved. In other words, I don't know how heavy objects are, for example. That's something I would need to discover by myself by trying, uh, by, by learning by experience. So then I'm gonna move to the second part in which the robot will keep that geometric knowledge base that it has learned from, uh, from demonstrations, and then it will have access to a simulator in which in its head can spawn multiple simulators with hypothesized values of the physical parameters of these objects, and then learn how to manipulate them uh, now with the physics included. <clears throat> so in the first part, uh, let's talk about how we learn multi-step manipulation tasks. And for that, I always put this example. Um, imagine this kind of uh, structure here, and the task is to grasp first the red handle to secure the, the box, and then to grasp the white cylinder to extract it. So, oh, the cylinder goes out. So there are, there are many steps, and every one of those steps have uh, geometric constraints. Uh, for example, when you extract the cylinder, you really need to move in a line. Otherwise, it's gonna get like locked or, or uh, you're gonna break the structure or something like that. Um, also, these are quasi-static quasi -static tasks. Uh, so we're now working with uh, things that will move pretty fast or will change in the middle of, of our task uh, for an external cause. So the idea is that our robot will start with some knowledge, geometric knowledge base of how humans typically manipulate objects. And the reason to, <coughs> to have this in memory is that we would like to learn the multi-step task from a single example. And if you really think about it, there is a fundamental limit to what you can learn from a single, single example just because there are ambiguities. So if I show you only one time how to do this, the best that you can learn is to repeat exactly the same task with exactly the same trajectories that I did. However, if you have this knowledge base of how humans typically manipulate objects, you will, you will have access to the information that some of those steps actually have uh, different variants and that you probably could have, maybe the human trajectory was this, but really here you could have been in any other position while when you grasp the object, you really had to satisfy a specific constraint. So the way this knowledge base looks uh, so far, it's basically we have known objects 
and there are simple shapes like cylinders and boxes. And then for each one of these objects, we have a set of modes, which you can think about uh, mode, uh, ways in which humans approach these objects. And those are typically you know, five or six, but it's not infinite numbers. It's not an infinite numbers of uh, grasps that you could do for an object. Uh, so we're gonna use that information in order to prune the search space uh, because this would be a continuous space and then it would be infinite. So we're gonna use those demonstrations and that knowledge uh, from human manipulation to prune that search space. Um, so this video here shows how we collect the demonstrations. So now that we're used to see, maybe we can collect demonstrations for video, from video of human doing the task, or we can put sensors on top of, on the body of a person to collect their motion. Alternatively, we could also uh, move the robot itself, that's called kinesthetic teaching. And in the case of my research, we have been doing it by having the robot in some sort of 3D user interface. Think about it like a video game. So you have the robot inside, you have the task, and then there is a human uh, conducting the end effectors of the robot, in other words, moving the hands of the robot to execute the task. And the, the human would say step one, step two, step three, um, and it will provide those, we call those steps, we call them keyframes. Um, it will provide those supervised keyframes for the robot to then match those keyframes with information that it has in the, in the knowledge base I described before. <clears throat> so basically we have a system that I call C-Learn for constraints learning. Uh, that was uh, ICRA 2017 where you have as an input that knowledge base plus the single demonstration of the multi-step task. Um, and the result of that is learning a series of uh, steps. They are order steps. Uh, and then for each one of the uh, steps, you learn geometric constraints. Um, and I'll talk about uh, why we want to learn geometric constraints as opposed to something else. Uh, but first, uh, what are the constraints? Uh, the, the type of constraints that we use in robotics could be, for example, a volume in a space in X, Y, Z, and, and the, the um, role PTO of the N effectors. So it's like a volume with some tolerance, so I can describe this space. If you remove the tolerance, then it would be exact position. I really need to be here. So for example, for grasping the cylinder, in the first keyframe, it really doesn't matter where you are, but when you approach the object, you really have to, for example, have one axis of, of, of your hand parallel to an axis on the cylinder. Uh, so other types of constraints are when you don't have tolerance, you have like this kind of parallel or perpendicularity um, constraints that will really ex uh, ask the robot to really satisfy those constraints as opposed to uh, something else. And these are very important in, in assembling or disassembly uh, tasks which are very typical in manufacturing. Um, so the reason we want to learn those constraints is that as opposed to previous work on learning from demonstrations where um, papers try to imitate an entire trajectory, we think that maybe some parts of that trajectory are irrelevant. I mean, it's just the way you happen to provide the demonstration, but not every single uh, part of your motion was relevant. So instead of learning an entire trajectory, we only learn these steps and these geometric constraints so that we can execute the task by going from, from one uh, step to the other uh, by invoking an optimization-based motion planner. So basically you can have the cost function of your preference uh, subject to that set of constraints that you have learned and that's how you can go from one step to the next. And I'll show you quickly how that looks. Um, as a good roboticist, I have to have videos. That's mainly what we do. So uh, this is Optimus, it's a 16 degrees of freedom uh, robot uh, that I have had um, the privilege to work at uh, with at MIT. Uh, so this robot is, um, is executing four different tasks that were learned with the procedure that I just ex uh, briefly explained. Uh, the first task is to grasp the, that like cylinder and then drop it in that bucket. The second task is the one I use as an example where you grasp first the, like the structure and then extract the cylinder. The third one, you open like the door of a cabinet and then push a button inside to turn on a light. It's cool when the light goes on. And then in the last task is to like move a tray 
And these tasks were chosen to, um, to uh, show uh, that this robot is actually learning the geometric constraints to do this work. A side effect of learning geometric constraints <coughs> is that what you have learned has, is not restricted to the specific body of the robot you are using. Uh, so we are able to just transfer that, that task that you learn to a robot with a completely different kinematics, a uh, comple uh, completely different body. Uh, this one is Atlas, which in addition has the requirement that it has to balance. Uh, so that's the, the benefit is that you can, you can write that also as a constraint. So you, you also write that constraint, you add it to the previous set, and then you can execute, you can plan and execute for this task with a completely different robot that also has to balance, which was not a requirement in the first robot. Uh, apparently I have taken a long time, so I'll go fast through the second part, which is the part I told you about. Um, now we know how to execute the task, but we only observe the geometry. So now I would like to have the robot training by itself in a simulator now with the physics uh, of the objects. And so far by physics, I only mean the mass of the object. Uh, that's what I have done. So my approach is to have access to a simulator, the, which is uh, an instance of a physics engine. Um, the, simula the, the robot will spawn multiple simulators uh, with different uh, properties of the objects to try by itself. And I will interleave task and motion planning during the search process. Um, guided by the demonstrations that it had uh, before. So instead of trying any random thing, it will try to remember things from the knowledge base and that's what it will try first. And finally, we will use uh, Monte Carlo tree search to guide, to basically run that search on the simulator. I'm very late, so I'll show you very quickly how the simulator looks like. I'm using PyBullet. Uh, it's, it's pretty good, I highly recommend it, at least from, from my user experience. Um, and we have connected the Pi Bullet, which is the window you see down at the left, with our visualization tool, um, which is called the Director. And the videos I'll show you next are only Director, but I promise they are running the physics behind using that Pi Bullet simulator. I'll skip this quickly because I'm super late. Uh, what I will show you is how the robot hypothesizes different possible values. So this task is to move the cylinder to one side and the block to the other side. Pretty simple. It learned how to do this task uh, from demonstrations, but it only observed the geometry. And here it will attempt that with a block of one kilogram. And for that block, it grasped it on the top, and that worked. Oh, good. I think, okay, grasped it from the top, and that actually worked. In another trace of the search, it went into a three kilograms block. And of course, you know what I'm gonna say, it felt. Go ahead, I have like one minute, 30 seconds. Uh, and the video is going pretty fast because it's sped up, but it, it really uh, is similar in the physics behind that. So you saw when it when it, it grasped and when it tried to move up, this, the block uh, felt basically. And that's because it was simply too heavy for that, uh, for that grasp. So these are things that you would know if you have a full model of the w how the world works, but if we don't write that in equations and give it to the robot, then the other option is learning this by experience, as a kid would do, for example. So we're giving the chance of a robot to learn those things by experience, uh, by hypothesizing physics in a simulator, try many multiple things, and at the end of it, what it will acquire is a model of what type of, of manipulation strategies are useful for different types of physics of the objects. Uh, yeah, I'll be happy to talk more to you around uh, the event. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's been a pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia. I hope you're coming next for the, for the beers, and I'm sure there's a lot of questions cool, from cool. the Latinx community. Um, so yeah, uh, we have the last presenter now coming. Uh, he's coming from MIT too. His name is Pedro Colon Hernandez, and he's a PhD student at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, Pedro was born in Puerto Rico, where he did his undergrad in computer engineering at the University of Puerto Rico at Magallanes. 
And Pedro opted to do graduate studies to develop intelligent agents that can guide people along when they're using technology. Today, he's going to present Hover, a wearable object identification system for audio augmented reality interactions. Thank you, Pedro. I'm going to set this up. Can you come? Uh, hi, I'm Pedro. I'm gonna finish this with a bang so we can, uh, you know, go and solve all our problems with uh, beers. Uh, and I'm gonna be presenting some of the work that I did uh, during my master's thesis, which is called Hover. Uh, and here's an outline of the talk. I'm gonna go quickly through the motivation, some work that's related to this, uh, the problem that I set out to explore, the approach that I took, and the results that I got in some work that I want to do now. Uh, so the motivation for this work, uh, there's two things. Uh, one is that I think finally augmented reality is finally going mainstream. There's a lot of companies like uh, Google, Microsoft, and Apple that are releasing toolkits, uh, hardware, and applications to give consumers access to augmented reality content. And this content has a lot of uh, promising uses, some of them being, uh, being able to guide and experience users throughout a task. Uh, and a really cool one, which would be to like sort of overlay information on top of objects. Uh, even though augmented reality has done leap, leaps and bounds in the software side, uh, it's still a bit behind on the hardware side. We have a lot of uh, sensors that we're not really taking advantage of. We're mostly using cameras. Uh, and the current approaches that we have uh, to access augmented reality content are intrusive, distracting, and a bit cumbersome for daily use. So that's some of the motivations. Uh, the deeper motivations behind this is that I, I, I get a lot of calls from my, my family and my friends on how to use uh, X or Y device or how to do X or Y thing in my computer. And it would be just be incredible if somebody made something to scan that something and that would just guide the person through how to use it. Or at least that was a dream. Uh, and the current approaches that we have right now to access augmented reality content is through phones, head-mounted displays, and what I call tagged objects. In the case of phones, we usually just open up an app, uh, point it at an object of, intre of interest, uh, and it gives us back some relevant content. Uh, in the case of head-mounted displays, we have things like uh, Google Lens and the Microsoft HoloLens, I mean, sorry, Google Glass, uh, which essentially are these glasses-like devices that we put in our heads, and they just overlay augmented reality information in our field of view. And lastly, the last approach that I, is what I call tagged objects, which are objects that are modified in some way or shape to contain either some identifier or some information that can be read through uh, some, some system. The problems with these approaches right now uh, in the case of the phone is that you have to have the right app for the right content. Uh, and since it's using a camera, it has to be between you and the object of interest. Uh, with head-mounted devices, we don't have that problem since things are just put in our field of view. However, the field of view on current devices is very small. Uh, and additionally to this, the devices that we have right now are pretty bulky. I don't know if you've seen a HoloLens, but it's not pleasant to work for more than like an hour. Uh, and in the case of the tagged objects that I mentioned, we run into a problem of scale that we have to tag each and every one of the objects that we want to be able to access. So with these things in mind, I set out and wrote like this question to kind of guide me, 
which is can we find a multimodal and seamless way to access, a conte to access contextual information tied to objects in our environment? To address this problem, uh, I made this device called Hover. It's a risk wearable device that uses a fusion of sensors, in this case a radar, some spectrometers and a camera to, re to get the reading of an object. Once the device knows what the object is, assuming it was uh, enrolled into the system, uh, it'll relay back some relevant information through an intelligent assistant. Uh, in this case, I opted to use uh, an open source assistant called Mycroft and implemented some skills within it. And I wanted this device to be sort of uh, discreet, so I put in a bone conduction headset so that whatever information is relayed back is relayed back sort of personally. Uh, so I, I wanted to do this on the wrist uh, primarily because there's research that shows you can put in things on people's wrists, for example, Fitbits and Apple Watches and so on and so forth. Uh, and additionally to this, it's, a, it's a, an area that's not really approached or not really uh, too far uh, investigated with regards to uh, the field of augmented reality. So with this in mind, I just set out to make a chassis that would hold all my electronics and all my stuff that I would just stuff in. Uh, and from left to right, we can see how things get progressively smaller. And on the far right, we see the wrist part that actually uh, goes on top of the boxes and clips onto your wrist. Uh, since I'm doing a sensor fusion approach, which is one of the unique things about this system, I opted to use a broadband camera uh, since we're not really seeing the images that, we, that the camera sees. Uh, we can remove the IR cut filter that these cameras have and give it access to a bit more information uh, within the images that it reads. Uh, I also opt to use a radar. In this case, it's called the distance to go board and two spectrometers, which are sensors that analyze how light bounces back uh, from surfaces. Uh, in my case, I used a visible light spectrometer and an infrared uh, light spectrometer. Uh, so I, I extracted some features from each one of these uh, sensors, uh, normalized them, and concatenate them all together to make this, uh, this very uh, rich object descriptor. In the case of radar, I used range Doppler maps and high range resolution profiles. In the case of spectrometers, I didn't go through something uh, too complex, so I just took essentially two measurements, averaged them out, uh, took out the RMS, the max and the min of these measurements, and used that as a reading. And in the case of the camera, uh, I was using handcrafted features, so I took a bag of visual words approach, which essentially uh, tries to find uh, clusters of salient features in images, and then formulates uh, histograms of how many of these salient features are present in an image. And that's what we use uh, as a descriptor. Uh, and for the intelligent assistant that I mentioned, I used uh, Mycroft. Uh, you can quite literally find this on the, on the web. Uh, and Mycroft has a sort of similar structure to Amazon's Alexa in which you add in uh, skills that it learns. Uh, and for this project, I made two skills, one to register objects onto the system and one to look up objects from the system. Uh, and with Mycroft, you can also engage the user sort of in conversation. Uh, so when uh, you're registering an object into the system, Mycroft will ask you like, oh, what is this object? And you can just tell it what it is and give it some description. And when you go and scan an object with uh, the hover device, it'll say, oh, this is uh, something. And some useful information is uh, whatever you put in. Uh, to test the system, I did two types of tests. Uh, one was uh, some user studies and a really, really, really simple uh, performance benchmark. In the case of the user study, I took in uh, 20 participants and put them in a room. It was not a closed uh, lo uh, locked room, so they were free to go if they wanted. Uh, and uh, I tasked them with identifying a set of objects with a uh, different device. Uh, in this case, the devices that were given to them were a phone with sort of a scanning application, uh, Microsoft HoloLens, and uh, the hover device. And I got the, their feedback from using the device uh, and comparing it with the other devices. And for the uh, performance benchmark, I simply took nine objects that I found in my office, uh, scanned them into the system, and then tried to classify them to see uh, if the device uh, got it right. Uh, in the case of the user testing results, uh, these are kind of general, but uh, if you want, uh, you can just ask me in the poster a bit later. 
uh, we got that Hover is comparably cumbersome with a mobile phone and that it's definitely less cumbersome than a HoloLens. What this means is that if I streamline the form factor a bit more, we can have a device that has all this functionality of accessing augmented reality without uh, you know, uh, the hassle of having to have a phone on your hand or feeling like you're uh, impaired by something. Uh, also, I found that Hover is comparable in immersion to the HoloLens. This was kind of surprising since the HoloLens essentially transforms your field of view. Uh, and I also got that Hover is individually less interruptive than a phone. However, when evaluated against a phone and a HoloLens, it's just as comparably as interruptive. And lastly, uh, I got that the, this device was comparable in intrusiveness with a phone and that it is considerably less intrusive than having a block on your head, which was the HoloLens. Uh, as for the performance benchmark, uh, after three months of uh, intense work and not too much sleep, I was slightly sad to see that the accuracy that I got over a base imaging system was not uh, that much higher. In this case, it's a 78% uh, accuracy for hover rather than a 75% accuracy for a phone. Uh, so I tried to find out what, what was up, and I realized that the radar sensor and the infrared spectrometer were introducing confusion into the system. Uh, this was due because the infrared spectrometer, I was just illuminating a small part of the band that it read. Uh, so I needed essentially a broadband infrared uh, LED rather than just a plain LED. Uh, I mean, infrared LED. And in the case of the radar, the range resolution of the radar, which is sort of uh, the minimum size that the radar can distinguish between objects, was uh, half a meter. So anything that was below half a meter, it could confuse. So uh, that's why these two sensors introduced some uh, confusion onto the system. So even with this, uh, I threw uh, the, this very rich uh, object uh, vector at, at, at a random forest and got uh, sort of this unoptimized 78% performance uh, with, uh, and compared to a support vector machine, which got a 65%, and uh, K-nearest neighbors, which got a 63%. This is, uh, once again, these results are without any optimization at all. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if I optimize this a bit further, this, each and every one of them would have higher scores. Uh, and some conclusions that I can draw from this work is that it's a very promising approach if I manage to streamline all the hardware into a more concise package. And I also uh, figured out that I need to tune and revise some of the sensors that I'm using in the system. Which leads to some of the future work, which is, as I already said, optimizing the form factor and adding some directionality assistant, assistance. Uh, in this case, since the device is worn on your wrist, you essentially point it at the objects that you that you're interested in, but since the feedback comes back through audio, you d really don't know what the device is looking at. So something like a laser pointer would uh, work miracles. Uh, and also I used handcrafted features, so some interesting thing uh, to look at would be to use learned features in the case to, would be to throw all these uh, readings into some sort of a neural net configuration and see what the, uh, the net learns. Uh, I also need to do some better testing rather than three, like, rather than nine objects that I just find in my office. Something a bit more in depth would be great. Uh, and so, sort of the uh, what I'm looking at right now for my PhD, uh, for my PhD is all the information that the system reads back is information that you put into the system, uh, and that the assistant has uh, access to. But what if the assistant could look up the information for you? What if the assistant could do some sort of a Google search for you, condense all the results and present them to you in a way that you, that would be useful for you and that you didn't have to pre-program? And that's it. Uh, here are all the references. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pedro. And, um, Posters are living. I just wanna, I just wanna take a few minutes. Uh, just uh, well, if there's something I've learned during six years working in the startup in the startup world, is that you have to celebrate wins along the way. Um, and I think today has been a huge win uh, for all of us and for the Latinx community. So I want everyone here to acknowledge that with a big round of applauses. First, <laughs> not yet. Not yet. We're gonna applaud for everyone. So first, for all the Latinx community here for your outstanding work 
uh, for all the researchers um, being part of the first ever Latinx workshop in New Rips. Uh, big applause, please, for all the oral and poster presenters who've been present with us today. Thank you too to all the sponsors, Google, DeepMind, Capital One, NVIDIA, Intel Corporation, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, and also, if you're here and you have a voice in your organization, please don't stop the collaboration here. This is one workshop that we've organized, but we have a long-term goal to make AI fair towards the Latinx community. So big applause for them too. <laughs> and just a small ask. <laughs> and also thank you to women in machine learning, black in AI, and queer in AI for leading the efforts towards diversity. A big applause for them too, please. Um, we're also be gonna be following the steps of women in machine learning to get uh, other people involved in next year's new rips. So please reach out to us if you wanna get involved as part of the organizing committee. Um, we're looking forward to having new people. And also, thank you to all the program committee who Janet Interian led with 30 people reviewing more than 100 submissions of people. Please, a big applause for them too. <laughs> to all the 30 volunteers and everyone involved in the design, in the video, in the photography, and all the logistics, this wouldn't have been possible without them. So, a big applause. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, to all the organizers in Latinx in AI, and especially Laura Montoya, who's been the mastermind coordinating everything so that all of us could, could enjoy the experience. So big applause for her too. <laughs> and finally, we're gonna send out a survey. Uh, so please do respond. Uh, your feedback is extremely valuable to improve and keep growing the Latinx community. It's our first workshop, so I'm sure we can all learn from this experience. And it's time for uh, unas cervezas, unas cheves, unas chelas, unas frías, unas birras, y unas cervejas. <laughs> which I think is how you say it in Portuguese. I don't know if I'm missing any words, but I try to find all of them. So everyone who wants to join us, we're going to Tavern Midway, which is in 2019 Boulevard Saint Laurent. Uh, we'll be walking there, although it will be cold, but it's like 10 minute walk. Okay, thank you.